The main area of national life in which the Polish government is not holding primarily to the status quo is in education. No one need be reminded that education is a primary means of effecting a gradual social change. And the Gomolka government has placed a high priority on continuing the development of Poland's educational system. All education, including the universities and polytechnical institutes, is free and scholarships to cover living expenses are easily obtainable from a variety of state sources. An intentionally discriminatory admissions policy favors the children of peasants and workers. This is a recently completed dormitory for young men attending Warsaw Polytechnic. It's called the Riviera. The state investment in education in Poland is very heavy. Through the state-supported Polish Students Association, cultural activities, student clubs, travel and vacations are available to students at minimal cost. This vast complex of services touches practically every aspect of a student's life. Welcome to another episode of Action Existing Socialism, a podcast dedicated to exploring past, present, and future real-world manifestations of action existing socialism by talking to those who've studied, extensively, lived in, or currently live in a socialist country. It's your host, Tony. What you just heard is a clip from a documentary on Soldiers Poland produced in 1965. You know, regular listeners of the show know that as guests, we've had scientists, we've had historians, we've had anthropologists, we've had activists join to talk about socialist countries. What makes this episode special is that it actually features um, a sociologist, Dr. Agata Zizak, who's going to talk to us about her recent book entitled Limiting Privilege, Upward Mobility Within Higher Education Socialist Poland, which came out last year, 2023. After listening to this episode, if, if you're so inclined to purchase Dr. Zizak's book, um, there's information in the show notes on how to get 30% off it uh, using a code that, that Dr. Zizak provided. This book examines first-generation students' struggles with reluctant academia in a developing socialist world as looking for equality. We talk about the successes and failures of this ambitious program, its similarities and differences to race-based affirmative action in North America relative to socialist Poland's class-based affirmative action, and what this tells us about social reproduction and the zombie impact of social systems even in the face of dramatic social revolution. Akta Zizak is a PhD in historical sociology. She works at Vienna University in Austria and the University of Lodz in Poland. She's also a local activist in the Topography Association, the NGO popularizing local history and gathering oral histories, which runs the social archive at mistograph.pl, which is spelled M-I-S-T-O-G-R-A-F.pl. I'd like to specifically shout out and thank my name, all of my new patrons since the last episode release. Those are SMB, Ryan Smith, Hugo Chavez 69, and Alex. I honestly could not do this show without your support, so thank you so much for that. If you'd like to support the show this way, you can become a Patreon subscriber at patreon.com slash AESThePodcast. If you can't contribute in that way, you can help out by sharing this episode by following us on Twitter at AESThePodcast. You can also subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform to get new episode notifications. Also, feel free to leave a review if you have time or even just a star rating. Uh, I recommend checking out the back catalog as well when you have the chance. Enjoy the episode. So I'm very excited to welcome Agata Zizak to the show. Uh, Welcome to the show, Agata. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, You know, I think our listeners are are very much so going to like this conversation because we're going to be talking about a country that we rarely hear about uh, in the West and definitely not about the socialist period. And that country is Poland, is also known as the People's Republic of Poland. So we're going to be looking at a country we don't normally hear about, but also looking at it through the lens of something that's kind of a hot topic right now, particularly in North America when it comes to affirmative action. Um, So recently, um, I believe it was last year, so in 2023, the U.S. Supreme Court decided to ban affirmative action uh, based on race or ethnicity in the United States. And so we'll be looking at it through a different kind of lens, of course, because your research focuses on it as essentially a class-based affirmative action. Is that a correct characterization of it? Definitely class is in the center. I was actually struggling if affirmative action might be a good title for the book, but because of of race and such a different social context, I haven't decided to do it. But logic is very much the same. It's kind of a class affirmative action indeed. 
you've taken up essentially looking at Polish history from below. I believe that's a way you've described it in one of your writings um, as your field of study, particularly with the focus, as we've already mentioned, in terms of post-secondary education, university education, and upward mobility. What led you to study that? Why is it a particular focus of yours? The beginnings were very modest and you can say even naive. It was my PhD. And the very basic question I started with was like, what's happening when the university is established in an industrial working class city? And you have obviously some tensions and clashes between working class character of the city and this kind of more elite intellectual goal of, of educating the, the masses, or maybe not so much. So university in Łódź, which was in the 45, the biggest Polish city in the new borders, Warsaw, the capital of Poland, was at that time destroyed, was indeed a textile industry. It was called often Polish Manchester. And the first time it saw university in its urban context was exactly under already this kind of pronounced socialist modernization. So the, the question maybe was naive, like what's happening? But actually it brought me to, to much broader argument about both social reproduction, upward mobility and its limits clash between intelligentsia, leftist intelligentsia, I'm with the regime, so state socialist regime, and also kind of the broader question of how you can rethink society and educational system and open it for people from modest backgrounds, in, in particular for the first generation of students. As listeners of the show have already learned about in other socialist countries, particularly the Soviet Union, what is definitely characterized as a class struggle between those who are the elites or the wealthy, and of course, the vast majority of the population who often prior to a revolution or communism taking power did not have ac much access to um, a universal education system and definitely not in the post-secondary level of education. In thinking about Poland in general, this episode, you know, we're not going to get too much talking about the broader history of the country. Um, I'm, I've actually gotten in contact with members of the Communist Party in Poland to speak with some people who actually lived, you know, who experienced that period as adults. So I'll save that the in-depth history for that. Poland was one of those socialist countries that became socialist after World War II. It's a bit, of course, a, a complex and a controversial the way that it became a communist, much like Czechoslovakia and Lithuania and Latvia and other countries, Estonia, other countries like that. More broadly, you know, when I was researching for this episode, there was very little information that I could find about Poland that wasn't looking at it from the perspective of what do you call the neo-totalitarian perspective or the totalitarian perspective. Everything like on YouTube or whatever, or Googling things, it was like Victims of Communism Foundation. Here's a terrible thing that happened. Here's where people were oppressed. Many times also it was focused on the 1980s and the 1990s. So even what was out there, it wasn't looking at what was happening in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the more, well, at least not all of that, but definitely in the middle there, there was a more stable period, you know. And when I did see things, it was um, statistics that were often decontextualized. Um, so there's a very interesting video. It came up uh, on my YouTube recommends as like something, oh, like, oh, you've been looking at Poland. Here's a video you should watch. And it was about the realities of uh, Polish socialism. And it was talking about, uh, you know, with all the, the scary music, and it was talking about how the nomenclatura, the nomenclatura? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nomenclatura, yeah. So they were kind of like, you know, the elites in the communist society, they were, you know, active members in the party and the governance um, of the country. And they were talking about how all the special privileges this group had. Uh, often they're like maybe made up 1% or even less than 1% of the population. And certainly they, this group definitely had um, different privileges to the majority of the population. But then when I looked up wealth inequality in during this period, it's very clear that wealth inequality was substantially lower during the socialist period than it is now. I believe uh, the stats I found said something like during the socialist period, the top 1% held about 5% of the uh, total income. And now in the post-socialist period, it's about the 1% holds about 15% of income that is generated. So massive inequality comparatively, not that it was perfect before, but, you know, comparatively. The main topic of your book, which is titled Limiting Privilege, Upward Mobility Within Higher Education um, in Socialist Poland, it looks at socialist uplift in the post-secondary educational sphere in socialist Poland. So can you lay for us, what were some of the theoretical or historical foundations of uh, limiting privilege in this way? And what were the hoped outcomes 
Yeah, so maybe let us step back a little bit to kind of settle the ground for the final argument of the book. So as you have mentioned, Poland became a part of the so-called Soviet bloc or Warsaw Pact, country that was involved in the socialist movement of the 20th century was 45. However, there was already lots of communist, state socialist, agrarians at that time in the interwar Poland. And I think we cannot understand, and, and I, like I, I cannot overstate it, we cannot uh, underestimate the role of interwar and the role of the Second World War to understand what was happening after 45. So first of all, interwar Poland and the society that experienced Great Depression, radicalization uh, of the right-wing uh, movements and also uh, rebuilding its legal structures, rising anti-Semitism. That was a, a, a deeply difficult situation and especially the universities, which were pretty uh, conservative, very elitist. The way of studying is like approaching the professor, preparing for the exams. Like you really have to already be socialized to know what to do to study at the university. There are very few so-called first generational students, that is students from peasant or working class background mainly. The society is mostly agrarian. Illiteracy levels are high. Unemployment is high. This is a tormented country and later the Second World War comes. And Poland proportionally is one of the most devastated countries because of the war. Not only it losses most of this Jewish population, it has also some German uh, dwellers along that also have to flee Poland uh, when the borders are shifted. And the majority of people who died is intelligentsia, and in particular academics, with like over 60% of this part of, of society is gone. So 45 is also a new beginning. Some scholars call it even social revolution, not only political one, but there was no way to get back to interwar Poland, both on the level of institutions, but even population. No skilled workers, no engineers, no physicians, and no academic professors, almost, right? So in this very tormented bloodlands that Central Europe is, a new state is being built. And there's really lots of hopes and lots of social support for rethinking what state is, what education is. There's big support for agrarian reform because Polish social structure constituted also with still very strong uh, nobility from the 18th and 19th century that was still a very powerful social group. And it was completely declassed after 45, not only because of the war that already kind of settled the ground, uh, but also because of this political shift. And for me, what was particularly important during the changes uh, at universities in the 30s, lots of more progressive, liberal and leftist uh, socialist scholars consolidated. They often would sign together uh, letters against some um, anti-Semitic actions. And after the war, there's lots of, of course, gossip, there's lots of chaos, but there is uh, lots of hopes and dreams to establish society anew and including that universities anew. It's kind of the melting pot. And for a very brief moment, we call it a gentle revolution. Still, it was not very well known what going to come. There's lots of uh, assumption that there were some instructions from Moscow coming in, some powerful communists. From my perspective as a sociologist, the reality was, as always, much more chaotic. There were fractions fighting. There was this chaos of first post-war years. There are no, no proofs that actually there were any kind of instructions. Uh, there's this um, uh, excellent anecdote about Czech communists who'd really like to get the instructions how to build a uh, university and reform higher education, but they actually cannot get it from Moscow. So in this uh, kind of chaotic times, there's lots of discussion how university going to be built. And there are a few assumptions. It's going to be more egalitarian. It needs to be open for working classes. But as well, academia as such cannot be any more ivory tower. And this is this is not a new discussion. It was happening for decades before. We have to remember this kind of continuity because it breaks this neo-totalitarian argument about uh, suddenly things happening out of nowhere or some powerful objects, subjects like a state that can suddenly rule everything. I don't think it, it's at any state uh, possible that we have such a powerful uh, few individuals, for example, like a communist in Brussels, Poland. The hopes are high and initial assumption is this very kind of utopian opening, pretty bold as well and realistic. So one of these assumptions is that universities is going to be this main channel of upward mobility, that they want to have like educated citizens. And considering illiteracy levels and the access to higher education previously, those are really, really bold assumptions. For example, 80% of each cohort is supposed to graduate from the university, which, which was not a 
never ever achieved like in any society. Also, the, uh, the, the word democratization is used. And I, I really would like to focus on this for a moment because it has nothing to do with the democracy we understand right now. Democratization meant at that time representation, equal representation of social structure. So people who enroll at the university and graduate, the proportion uh, of the social origin should reflect the social origin in a society. So if we have majority of peasants in the society, that should be also the majority of people who graduate. There's lots of also grassroots uh, initiatives. Many of them are focused to just overcome wear gaps in education, but later they are re-articulated by a state as a tools for this opening universities for, uh, for people from more modest background. This is a kind of the new beginning for both society, political order, recognizing who is a, a subject of the state and who can actually access university. And there are different levels when this change is happening. The social reality here is, is really complex. So on one level, we have all the political decisions, the reform of higher education, which is also kind of mediated through, through the years. Particular solutions like redefining what study means, making, making, for example, more accessible for those who actually don't understand what university is. They should be, students should be like a workers in a factory with a strict schedule, uh, strict hours when you should be at the university, uh, writing down curriculums, uh, not kind of this uh, very unstructured way of studying. If you have never, ever, none of the member of your family ever access university, you have, you have no idea what does it mean to study. So in one hand, often the reform is framed as a kind of oppressive authoritarian rule over the, the academia. But at the same time, there's another perspective, which we can see that is also kind of giving a very systematic, parametrized way of dealing with higher education. Initiatives like preliminary year or initial year, those were the tools that people who didn't have enough years of education could just in two years do a few years of, of elementary and high school and prepare themselves to enroll for, for the universities. Those courses were uh, attended by, in majority by working class and peasant students. This is also the aspect of reality that is often, I think, misunderstood. I mean, the post-war press. Often this is framed as a kind of propaganda or newspeak that brainwashed people. But if we think about the massive change of language, reshaping what universities, professors, students, it was an enormous tool of reshaping or reimagining the world, changing social imaginary. By this, I mean what people understand and how they communicate senses. And also, press was, was becoming a big thing in a, in a post-war time. Not only the amount of titles, access to the press. Uh, lots of newspa newspapers were read aloud in the factory floors. Uh, it was accessing uh, villages and small towns, encouraging people to enroll to the university. So I think this is also another aspect which is profound and changes the role of daily press into a tool that was widening horizont of expectations, that it was thinkable for someone from a remote rural area to enroll at the university, knowing that the, what are procedures, what you should do to enroll, that there's going to be a dormitory, meal, health, healthcare, and so on. So uh, there were lots of aspects of the change and the political reforms or intellectual debates about shape of university is just, just one aspect of that. Thank you for that. That was a, an excellent answer. That has my mind going in like 20 different directions. So the point you'd made about the, the state of Poland before the war and then throughout the war where it was absolutely devastated and coming out of that was a revolutionary period, a revolutionary time and things were changing. I, I've seen two different views on this. One is that, as you mentioned, is like kind of a an imposition of the of the Soviet Union on Poland to make all these changes happen. But then there's this other there's this view that you know that you've kind of mentioned here that it wasn't necessarily a revolution in the sense of the October Revolution, but the devastation of society, the impact on the intelligentsia or the the elite class, um, the new chance for opportunities made it a revolutionary. Um, scenario. So that was very interesting for you to break down. Uh, the other point you made about democratization, and this is, a, I think, a theme that's run through different episodes of the show, is understanding that there's different ways to define democracy. And the way that democracy has been defined, particularly in socialist countries, has been, as you mentioned, the egalitarian distribution of resources, whether it's universal health care, education, um, vacations, like whatever it is the state is providing, definitely not in the, the scenario of a parliamentary democracy or multi-party system where you vote for um, this party or that party, certainly not. But they had this other form, um, which was in terms of providing um, a social infrastructure for everyone. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I think we kind of lost also this perception of uh, social citizenship. We're probably going to get back to that. But I think it really took some time after the transition in the 90s when people lost some of these privileges that actually healthcare is not an obvious thing. And actually uh, public education, like coming from US, whoever would listen to that would know that this is not an obvious thing. But at that time, you know, for example, the... Um, allocation of the jobs. So it was planned economy and there was assumption that after graduating, you're going to have an assigned work just a post waiting for you. And later in the 70s and 80s, it became rather kind of a joke and there was lots of lots of lots of jokes that you actually don't have to go to work. Whatever you do, you still get the salary. But at that time, after Great Depression, that, that was really something that encouraged people, for example, to risk additional years of education, not earning money, that there's still going to be something waiting for you. There's also a debate in the interwar about overproduction of intelligentsia, that we don't want to have so many teachers, educated members of the society because we have no jobs for them. So it really mattered. And, and there was completely different context for this um, job allocation, um, obligatory employment employment in the 40s and 50s than, than we see it nowadays. I wonder if there may have been some in the in the 80s and the 90s, maybe misunderstandings in terms of the West was pre- presenting itself as, as liberal democracy. And so people who, who were raised in the Soviet bloc, they understood democracy, at least in some sense, to include healthcare, education and all those things. But liberal democracy doesn't guarantee any of any of those things. Um, and so some of that may have been lost in understanding or expectation, rather, of what democracy uh, entails. Another episode of the show, particularly speaking about the 1930s era of Soviet, Soviet Union and other periods as well, uh, we've talked about uh, these essentially affirmative action principles being applied to different national minorities. So whether it's the Northern peoples of the Soviet Union or um, you know people who are indigenous to Tajikistan or other places that were part of the Soviet orbit. And I feel like that's something that is not well understood in the West, that these ideas, as you mentioned, they, they, they didn't just you know spring out of nowhere in 1946 in Poland. Uh, they'd been expressed by different leftists and Marxists as ways to uplift the population through education by granting, and even through employment as well, by granting them these different opportunities. You know, I was looking at affirmative action. I looked that up on Wikipedia, for example, to see what, does it mention anything about the this Soviet bloc history of, you know, allowing these opportunities for people? No, nothing. It just, it just talks about the U.S.'s experience um, of affirmative action, as if it just suddenly sprung out from uh, John F. Kennedy in the 1960s, despite that. Again, spoken on this in a previous episode, but uh, th- this idea that essentially liberal states, it seems, particularly in the 20th century and even now, they eventually adopt these watered down, watered down versions of these policies, as you mentioned. So affirmative action was in the Soviet Union, and then it gets taken up in the U.S. in the 60s and the 70s and other parts of Europe as well, as essentially concessions in some way to the general population to maintain the system. If I can uh, respond to, to those comments, two, two things came to my mind. One that's unfortunately like implemented, actually existing socialism often had also this very ugly national face. And I think there is a kind of um, struggle inside the movement bec- between this more internationalized, sensitive, more leftist uh, version and this kind of national strong state authoritarian. This is all inside the story. In case of Poland, actually, it was more this uglier national face. Poland, after the war's extremely mononational and it remains it till nowadays. So because of most of the Jewish population is gone and, and the experience of Holocaust is so profound that there's even no data in statistics, in the state statistic, which students are Jewish, just in case we don't ask. The same religion is not present. Everything is very much focused uh, around the class, often differently defined. But most of the archives I looked through, they are all obsessed with uh, with a differently defined class and class origin. Uh, even the gender aspect is not so much present, and it's more, mostly sociological research that allows us to have some insights to that. I don't think we can think about uh, labor rights, uh, civil rights, uh, not considering that at that time, in the, from the 20s and also with the post-war, there were uh, competing projects of what social reality might look like. Both had lots of dark and, let's say, gloomy parts and, and tricky elements, uh, sometimes co- contradictive and paradoxical. But at the same time, they were defining each other. I find here a uh, work of Susan Bockmore's Dreamland and the Catastrophe. Those were two words that were defining each other. And we cannot think of 
capitalism without uh, socialism and act actually existing state socialism in, in particular. That, that's a very great point is that those these two systems were in conversation with each other and sometimes, you know, I don't say copying each other, but being inspired by what the other one is doing, whether to, you know, implement or follow something like that or to not, to do the exact opposite of that. So no, that's a very good point. How did the system of limiting privilege work as intended? So how, how did it actually work in practice? And what ways did it not work in practice as they'd hoped for? The privilege in the title, this limiting privilege, is actually two privileges. One would be a state-guaranteed privilege for working classes, and by plural I mean peasant and working class, which was very, like, urban working class was very limited in, a, in the post-war years. There were just few industrial centers, and it was, as I mentioned, mainly agrarian society. So the working classes in the rural are uh, encouraged by the state policies to enroll at the university, to become students, become part of the intelligentsia and build this new intelligentsia in assumption uh, that would be pro-state uh, socialism and would build this new uh, new professionals. And this uh, privilege, state-guaranteed socialist privilege, is in a way in conflict and clashes with more traditional old privilege of elites. And in here I mean mainly intelligentsia, which is kind of a Eastern European specificity of educated, engaged, usually like pu publicly active uh, strata of society. And definitely that includes academics. And of course, the domain of power is university. So we have this moment of the clashes of, of the capitals. But big guide, for, guide through the study is uh, Pierre Bourdieu, a French sociologist, and his notion of different social capitals, which I think work very well here because after the war and after also all the reforms, we cannot actually compare and rely on economic capital more cultural uh, capital counts, like who you know, uh, what is your education, how well you can navigate around the social dimensions, let's say. So whatever change is being implemented, there's going to be a conservative response. And what I have mentioned, the political reform, a debate about universities that was reshaping what the university is trying to implement the socialist university. Later, press campaign, all those tools that were uh, implemented to encourage people to enroll. The social structure of people enrolling at the university is changing. And what we know from sociologists' insight already happening from the um, late uh, 50s, because sociology was banned during the Stalinization period as a bourgeois science, but we still got, uh, got really, really good uh, research insights to that. We know that those who somehow managed to enroll at the university, being from the modest background, experienced lots of discrimination based on the class, even though it was already a decade into the state socialism building, even though it was uh, happening, for example, in Łódź, in this flagship socialist university that was just established without former continuity with some kind of pre-war conservative elite. And even though this is the context of this working class industrial city. And when we go farther into tracing what was happening uh, in a, in a post-war time, considering access to education, uh, this fight with illiteracy that was actually a big success, we can see that one of the biggest successes of uh, state socialism in Poland was massification of elementary school. Most of the people did graduate from elementary school. However, the main selection and therefore the main um, platform for upward mobility were not universities. Despite the whole campaign after war, it was secondary level of education. That was the place when actually the so-called educational selection was happening. People who entered university were already those few who were, I don't know, more stubborn, had more resources. In a way, that was a miracle that they make it because the projected trajectory of their future education coming from the, the place in social structure did not assume they're going to get that high. So vocational schools and technical schools very soon, I mean, from the 50s, became the main focus of uh, the socialist modernization efforts. University was too much time. There was too uh, much need of new skilled workers, specialists, and they were needed a faster track to get people uh, back to work and uh, back to, you know, ongoing industrialization that was happening at the same time. Revisiting, in a way, lots of the sociological research statistics from that time, uh, we could say that most of the upward mobility was happening via vocational schools and technical schools. There was a big differentiation based on rural versus urban environment and also uh, by class and finally by gender. So the least chances to actually graduate from secondary level education uh, or from some small town remote village area, girls, women, 
And of course, the biggest chances would be on on the side of uh, urban centers, uh, well-educated parents. Uh, of course, this here also the political capital gets in, and lots of people who wouldn't have this kind of cultural capital of intelligence in the interwar, but make political careers were also in play. Uh, but this this was, as, as you mentioned, uh, a minority of society. From this perspective, we can see that yes, upward mobility is happening on an enormous scale. And the educational level of society, especially comparing this interwar position, is, is rising. It's like chasing up in this kind of modernization paradigm of progress uh, that you might, might skip few places faster than, than it was happening in the West. It is happening, but th- those are not universities that are the platform of this change. And when we look at the universities as this, the most elitist, the most uh, selective elements of uh, educational system, we can see that there's very, very few people who graduate. So even if you enroll at the university, the dropouts for the uh, peasant and working class origin kids are higher. Fewer of them um, would graduate and fewer of them would get a stay uh, at the universities to begin the academic career. Also, this job allocation, it occurs that those who could and had social capital for that would search for job position by themselves and therefore found better positions, better salaries in the cities. And those who were of the most modest background, women included, would only them would have to rely on a state as a kind of uh, insurance of their secure professional career. So they would be probably sent as, a, I don't know, biology teachers so to some remote village area instead of becoming um, a researcher in the biology institute in one of the main uh, cities in Poland. So there's lots of stratification happening also on, during the process of obtaining um, education. That brings up an interesting parallel because yeah, I was reading this in your work as well that peasants and workers were allowed into the university system at a higher rate, of course. But also, when it came down to graduation, as you mentioned, they were more likely to be the ones who would drop out. Um, and I think there's a quite a similar parallel to that uh, experience to African Americans in the U.S. going to university in general. And I think, um, and, and you can provide some insight into this. Was this because there was like other factors? that were going on, kind of like you mentioned, um, maybe their parents didn't go to um, university. So it's kind of like, well, they don't have kind of like that that history or other sociological things to that. Um, what were the reasons they were dropping out or that you're aware of? Thanks to some sociological research, again, we actually had interviews with people who were dropping out. And the reason they were giving was often that they do not feel welcomed in a way. They don't feel good. They feel endangered. They don't know what to do. They don't get enough support. Some of them had to support their families as soon as possible. So it occurred that they, in a way, overestimated help of the state and, and the, let's say, strength of the network, both state-guaranteed and socially guaranteed by, by their families and colleagues and so on. So the dropouts rarely are so because of some health issues and so on. But really, majority of the, of the reasoning behind it is like, this is not a place for me. I, I want to do something else. I don't feel safe here. I don't feel I can do it. Also, we have very strong sociological research we can revise right now. So, for example, there's lots of uh, research into the values of, uh, that families believe in, kind of projected educational choices, really lots of very good stuff that did not get old and was not like politically driven research. And from that, like generalizing from really lots of studies, we can say that for working class families, the main assumption was to avoid physical work. That was already upward mobility if you're not working with your hands. Via vocational schools and technical uh, secondary schools, you could easily achieve that in just three, five years. And you can earn by yourself. You can get independent. You can get married because, well, you have your salary. Uh, While taking the longer path at university was simply risky and took much more time. Another thing, okay, salaries were flattened in this kind of state socialism, more equal society. But still, when we research households, we see that intelligentsia managed navigate through the system and has bigger flats, more washing machines, more TVs, more radios, and so on, so on. So even with this kind of equalizing provided by the state, we can see that the the stratification is happening. And getting back to those values for intelligentsia families, not obtaining a diploma by a child was already degradation. You know, the stakes are different here. This is how exactly the the reproduction works. For women, the same. There was ongoing debate again from the interwar, like, shall we invest in women's education because they're just going to hunt for husbands and later end up as a a housewife? Even through through the years, of course, we have a bigger group of uh, women and working class men and so on entering universities, but definitely there is a selection happening. 
Let me give you one insight. I was examining biographies of those who became professors. They entered universities in the late 40s and 50s and was examining this whole cohort. And later I was checking like who became a professor. And it occurred that being a woman and being of peasant or working class origin wouldn't get you there. So the least you could be as a woman to become a professor was becoming from a teacher's family. Nothing lower. Only men from peasant or working classes would get there, and there were only few. But we could see how gender and class intersect here. There, there is no factor of race actually happening, especially in the 40s and the 50s. Later, some international students are coming, but it's, it's not so messy that we could build some, some further argument. As I mentioned, Poland was really very mononational, monoethnic at, at that time. And the, the kind of a Jewish uh, question only gets back in the 60s, 60s in the very uh, rough political context, which is not exactly in the focus of my book. But at that time, actually, class is this main lens. But when we focus on the gender, we can see that they do intersect, both on the level of uh, um, higher education and also the secondary education. As an anecdote, anecdote I can ask, add that um, there was a problem how to encourage girls to enroll to technical schools. And one of the problems uh, that was examined by the commission is like, how are we going to do it? It was that like, we don't have even restrooms. There are no toilets for female uh, students in the infrastructure, a massive infrastructure of the whole country. So that were the problems, the tasks that, that they were struggling uh, Just to decide before kind of get back to our, to the discussion uh, for the listeners, uh, the name of your book is Limiting Privilege, Upward Mobility, Within Higher Education in Socialist Poland. So definitely check out that. Um, you also, on your academ- academia.edu page, have a ton of articles. Uh, I do recommend people uh, check those out if you're able to get the book as well. A lot of things in English and different languages as well. So kind of kind of in response to what you said, what I'm understanding is that despite the implementation of the system, there was essentially two kind of roadblocks that are preventing like the ideal outcomes of it, which was, you know, egalitarian um, outcomes is on one end, there's cultural perceptions of peasants or workers as being less than so they they maybe get to university but they're experiencing a hostile environment where people don't necessarily accept them and i think again there's a parallel there there between this and affirmative action programs in terms of race in the u.s and other other countries and then the other side is this concept of social reproduction which you mentioned that there's still all of these despite a communist revolution there's still these structures that perpetuate themselves that still benefit the intelligentsia and that requires much more effort to address or dismantle it has to be consciously done not like oh we're saying these nice things therefore it's going to happen there has to be more work to address them um so we've talked about of course the university opportunities for peasants and workers being opened up for a very small group of those of the total population, but an opportunity nonetheless. More likely, there was bigger opportunities when it came to vocational schools and technical schools and the general univer, 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 universalization, universalization, there we go, of education. So with that said, were there any other examples of how privilege is limited outside of this in Poland, socialist Poland? One of, uh, of the great examples was, uh, was this... Um location of what you're doing after graduation. But we can also see that, for example, general secondary schools that were the most secure path to enroll at the university. Let me maybe also uh, zoom out for a moment how the educational system is designed. So elementary schools are this kind of obligatory part of education. It's eight years. And later you can decide to which secondary school you're going to go. And not all of them and with an exam that allows you to enroll at the university. So they are, in a way, blind paths. And this is a very crucial moment, because if you choose this blind path, later it's like much more work to pass this exam externally or get once more time to the secondary education institution. So this is the moment that lots of things is being decided in a way, but people usually don't know it's happening because they have, have no knowledge. Uh, and at the, at the certain moment, state is not advertising so much about, for universities, but for this fast track, just getting the skill trade and getting back uh, to, to, the, uh, to the work market, although not market as we, as we understand it nowadays. And the interesting case here is with, with uh, girls, with women, young women, uh, who often choose this uh, general education, uh, general uh, secondary school, which is like, you have some biology, uh, philologies. This is like today's high school, yeah, as, as we imagine. It's not like so, so concentrated on getting a profession. And they are still a majority. 
But later, when they enroll and drop out also more often, it occurred that this is one of the biggest traps considering young women that they end up without actually a skill. What's happening when we evaluate from this like macro perspective, what was happening with upward mobility in the society during that time, it occurs that the kind of the most radical parts, so the most elitist and the least uh, elitist, like the lowest strata, remained almost the same through the whole state socialist period. So mobility was happening from those uh, in the middle. It, there was a broad group, uh, the biggest, but still, for example, uneducated textile workers from Łódź Often the children would work in the very same company, but uh, owned by the state this time, for the generations. So this is kind of profound study of, of how difficult it is to open social structure, even if you implement so many political pressure, solutions, the whole campaign of also changing, because the campaign I was analyzing was focused mainly on university students and professors. But the whole narrative about the state and who is a citizen changed at that time. And still, it was not enough to make it as egalitarian as we would imagine. So in a way, social structure is stubborn and there is this reluctant elites that are not so eager to, to open up, especially in academia. I think researching technical universities is also a different story. Engineers were absolutely crucial for, for all state socialist countries and this is a different story. However, universities, I mean mainly social sciences and uh, humanities, remain this more most elitist and therefore most egalitarian. I would like to get back for a moment for these professors I have analyzed. So those very few of peasant, mainly peasant actually, and working class origin, all of them were socialized to these traditional values of academia. So in their narratives, they are not refer referring to uh, the project of uh, socialist university, its values and so on. They are still in this more traditional milieu of master and the student, kind of individual ivory tower-like research and so on. So it also proves that if you, that was a condition of upward mobility, if they wouldn't become part of this old intelligentsia and its values, they probably wouldn't make it. The lots of example like the source of power of uh, biographical uh, material you cannot get it through the statistics there are anecdotes of professor hiding that he has an open position because he's afraid that someone from the party is going to allocate a more progressive student he want to choose it uh, him or her the future uh, co-worker by himself so he will be sure that this is a decent person and this is happening all over all, all over again this official narrative about uh, state socialism and universities that focus on many two narratives of captivity and seduction. So we have captive academia uh, oppressed by the political uh, pressure or seduced, actually they are complementary, and seduced students who are kind of believers into fake idealism of, of Marxism and, and socialism and so on. And they are in a way tricked into believing into the system. And I think this is like an absolutely unjust and incomplete story considering what was happening. But at the same time, we can see that uh, intelligentsia and the professors were really effective in navigating through this political pressure and defended their field of autonomy. Out of 11 uh, assistant professors who lost their jobs during the Stalinization period, nine gets back. So what kind of political pressure it was was so ineffective. One thing is that Polish communists were not extremely powerful. They were marginalized. There were also fractions. They were quarreling a lot. And it's for sure not the case of, I don't know, Romania, Soviet Union. Poland was pretty, in a way, liberal in a bloc. It was pretty open. Lots of things was possible, while it was not the case of other state socialist republics in, the, in Eastern Europe. But still, it, it shows that this experiment was, was in a way, limited. And, and academia indeed uh, managed to defend itself. Again, seeing the parallels between this program, this class-based form of action in Poland and the race-based form of action in the, in the United States is that people are benefiting from these new opportunities that are granted. And there's definitely like nice flowery language, which is presented along with it. But when it comes to particularly at like the, the, the higher um, positions or whatever, there's certainly selectivity when it comes to a black person or a person of Asian descent that they kind of have to agree with us in a sense, like they have to fit a certain mold um, or they, they can't be a radical or whatever, however they perceive radical to be and be with us because that isn't the good version of this we want. We want our version of it kind of thing. So yeah, um, thanks for breaking that down for us there. This can be expanded as well to this next question to the vocational schools as well, um, because I know universities didn't necessarily impact a huge percentage of the population. But what are the legacies of these policies today in Poland? Because uh, I do know, for example, when it comes to women in Eastern Bloc countries, 
Today, we still see higher percentages of women in certain scientific fields or mathematics fields in the Eastern Bloc as opposed to the West because of these socialist programs. Uh, does anything like that exist for Poland? So actually, gender um, divisions in Polish academia are pretty severe, especially the most elitist institution like a Polish Academy of Science, which is by irony established during Stalin's time, <laughs> but it remained actually very, very elitist. Even if we agree that majority of upward mobility was happening on the secondary education, still uh, rates for college education in all countries in the Soviet bloc, except in Albania, actually, uh, were leaving behind even Latin America, which is of, often kind of a comparative reference point towards Eastern Europe, seen as a little bit more just while we compare it with the, with the West, with all this, you know, colonial power and everything. So in a way, even with this, we can see that it was a successful modernization. I think there's, once again, we have to get back to the starting point, how uneducated and how, I don't, I, I mean, struggle not to use the word backward because this is like a very complicated also debate on modernization and so on. But there was lots of work happening, lots of, okay, let's call it modernization, like electrification, uh, fighting illiteracy. This was all, how many newborns survive per 1,000? Like this, this is massive and spectacular uh, advancement. And there's lots of uh, scientific fiction, political fiction. What would happen if Poland would be part of the uh, of the West, or, of the West, that wouldn't be a part of the Soviet bloc? And of course, some of those things would probably happen because we have this kind of a uh, way of, I don't know, opening uh, universities, also happening in the West and so on. But I'm not a fan of, of speculation here. We have a very concrete case and concrete data, and we can see it, it's really achieved a lot. And especially in those first post-war decades, because later, also in the 60s, like to what extent it was still state socialist, to what extent it was like trying to, to make a more social aware version of maybe capitalism to strong world. And also reality in the 80s, in, uh, in Poland. This is a really miserable moment in Polish history and the condition of, of living were very, very difficult. At the same time, social reproduction was still happening and, and actually lots of elitist patterns got back in the 80s. And actually, this is also interesting insight. If you consider the proportion of working class and peasant students, the best they got, the most egalitarian, let's say, in two moments during Stalinization, and later in the 60s, when they realized that actually reform is not going so, so good, so they pushed again towards the reforming universities. And for the first time, the points for social origin, like the points you get enrolling at the university, were based on your class uh, origins. You were asked what's the profession of your father, and depending on that, you would get additional points to enroll at the university. It never happened, even, like, it didn't happen even in, uh, during Stalinization, although it was taken into consideration, your social background. Here, I think we need to address also the question to what extent we can relay on the data, uh, because there's also often this argument that, oh, we cannot delete this data from a state socialist, especially during Stalinization period. And in a way, yes, there was probably lots of manipulation. Probably we have it even nowadays with evaluating, I don't know, Eastern grants from European Union and so on. Well, we do adjust, everyone adjusts to, to the kind of institution in power. Uh, however, in Polish case, there's so many levels that you can obtain data from the universities, local councils, ministries. Again, there's this massive body of sociological, anthropological, and so on research that gives us insights from many different perspectives. And even nowadays, uh, discussion about value of this material evaluates it as a, as a decent and reliable I think critically, we can believe in this data. And also there are so many definitions of who's intelligentsia, who's a working class. And we have to assume there was neg lots of negotiating. And the, the, I have lots of example, lots of examples from like people, I don't know, someone owning a mill in a village, but later was declaring that there was a son of a, of a mill worker. And of course, people were, were trying to navigate through, them system, through, through the system. But I, I guess the majority of the movement, you can still see the tendencies. Yeah, that was kind of um, a comment maybe, because I think it's, it's necessary also to be aware that this is not exactly the data we have in many Western countries. At the same time, I believe that this kind of a logic of governmentality thinking exists as well at the, in, in capitalism or whatever system that, you know, there is a power in language and structure in, in reporting and so, so on. So the solidarity movement is essentially the liberal movement that really... Um, you know, push for the liberal democratization of Poland and ushered in its market period, uh, or however you want to, one would phrase it. 
what what was their position on all of this? Like, um, I'm definitely, of course, it's a group of people, different perspectives. But was there any comment towards like this system is unfair? You know, like in the U.S., there's always been detractors of affirmative action. Did that exist in Poland? And did the Solidarity Movement have anything to say about that? Do they want to maintain that or remove it or? Excellent question. However, I'm not an expert on solidarity in the 80s. Uh, so uh, let me wrap it up uh, from a little bit different angle. From the beginning, there was like an ongoing discussion, what is the, the best solution, how it's going to work. And there was an internal criticism. So after Stalinization was fading away, actually already after 53, the whole sociological research we have now was ordered by the state. So they would know what was working and what was not. And it was planned to, to, uh, to serve as a base to rethink and what can be done, what other reforms can be implemented. And solidarity is a great example of also I'm to reform socialism from inside. And now we think about solidarity as they were gonna go, gonna open state socialism and introduce free markets and liberal democracy. But that was not the case at that time. It was more discussion about how to reform socialism. The research from the 80s among students was showing that majority of them was supporting state socialism, but not in the form they had actually existing, <laughs> playing with the title. So I think there's lots of faith in the system and building alternative way. You know, this is a ma massive project. There's lots of, of that in, in your pod podcast, seeing state socialism and socialism in general as a as kind of global project, offering also cosmopolitan version of the world, classless. Those are you know, beautiful ideals, right? When they hit the ground, we can see how complicated the story is. But even in the 80s, the kind of support for socialism as a concept was high. Of course, we can try to criticize it. Oh, whoever answered the survey could be afraid that the so, so, I don't know security forces would trace him. I don't believe that it would be too omnipotent and too much conspiracy. And there are multiple examples of how it was rather an attempt to reform uh, socialism from inside. Even solidarity was part of this this critical voice. So that question was actually provided by a Patreon subscriber, a Justin. So thank you, Justin, uh, who's a listener of the show, of course, and subscriber. Thanks for providing that question because it was definitely an interesting one. Last question. Um, so. How are the programs such as these remembered in Poland today or even not remembered? Do they come up at all? Do people think about it as a good thing or a bad thing? Or, yeah, could you explain that? We have mentioned uh, at the beginning that there was this kind of neo-totalitarian or totalitarian turn in Eastern Europe in general in perceiving uh, state socialism. And it was based on many levels. There's lots of research on that. But in general, the whole period was framed as a kind of this time of oppression. And... For me, as a young scholar, it was also very difficult to make this argument that despite sed uh, seduction and captivity, maybe we can see empowerment and, and emancipation for first-generational students. And I think what we face right now, at least in Polish case, is kind of the, the revisionist turn in general towards the uh, Polish history. So, for example, we have lots of exciting research happening with reinterpreting serfdom. And nobility, which was a kind of the big story for Poland on its supposedly open and democratic uh, nobility-based society. And it revised it. Well, no, actually, it was almost like a slavery. And there's really lots of things happening right now. And it reaches post-war period as well. And my research is part of that, this kind of re revisionist uh, look on state socialism, seeing it as also opening a social structure, changing education, providing civil divorce and reproduction laws for women. And to some extent, it's like also getting back to what was a state of arts 30, 40 years ago. But there was kind of the amnesia and rewriting the history. Also, in the whole region, we have, and we have still in some, some of the countries, more this right-wing perspective on writing the history, more national-based, concentrated on political elites and elites. And from this perspective, I also believe that you, you tell a completely different story. If you focus on ministry archives and political things, I'm a sociologist, uh, not a historian. And maybe that allowed me also to see this broader uh, scope of changes in, in post war Poland. Definitely, there was kind of amnesia. It considered also, I don't know, so socialist feminism, uh, that the whole tradition of feminists was forgotten. And uh, only recently, uh, there was a, a great book published showing this, this kind of heritage that, for example, feminists in the 90s and 20s would rather refer to West. Uh, U.S. included uh, feminist movement instead of their own traditions, which were also even more progressive. 
so so there's definitely lots of interesting things going on not only in Poland I believe but this is the field I know the best and the, the 90s and early 2000s I was a, a profound shift in producing discourse on, on Polish history definitely there was not much place to talk about opening social structures and even today like when you think about Stalinization it's not the first thing that comes to your mind right well, definitely thank you for that uh, Agata this was a very great discussion you know we've talked about a topic in a country that we do not hear about in the West uh, very much I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show to explain all of this uh, to us and I know of course your work is ongoing and there's topics of say for example you're developing a concept I believe that you coined the term for which is socialist citizenship that runs through your work but I think maybe we'll take another episode in the future uh, to discuss that topic once you've developed it and had more time uh, to research it so uh, again thank you so much and really appreciate your time here today thank you it was a pleasure 